Well, good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be here. Excellent. Um, well, why don't we be like a couple of good paratroopers and uh, jump right in. Sure. <laughs> so, what could you tell me about, or please tell me about the, uh, your, like your upbringing and what led you to get into the Army and then, then the Special Forces? You know, that's a good story. <clears throat> At 17, uh, I went into the military to the Los Angeles County court system of the juvenile. And I had a semi-sensitive record as a juvenile. And I went to court and the judge who had seen me a couple of times in front of him said, I'm gonna give you a break. He says, if you get your parents to sign for you, I'll go ahead and give a waiver to you and you can go in the military if you pass the army test. So I went down, passed the army test, at 17, I was on my way to Fort Ord, California, where I attended basic training and AIT. And from there, when I enlisted, I enlisted for airborne unassigned. And I got assigned to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And at that time, what they did is they kept all the non-jumpers in a paratrooper unit, and they used to lock us up at night so we wouldn't go anywhere. And uh, every time we had a formation, We'd have, to set, we'd have to be in the leaning rest position. We had a sergeant major that would talk for, it seemed like hours, and we'd be in that leaning rest position for the whole time that he's talking. And also a thing back when I was in, uh, in the early 1960s, they used to pay us cash on paydays. They would have a pay officer would come up and they would divvy out the money and stuff, and you get your money that way. And at that time we had, uh, the Army Relief Fund, we had the Red Cross, we all had tables as we went down with our money and we'd have to, you know, divvy up. And we had a sergeant major that had a old motorcycle that he used to raffle. And for two years that he was there, no one ever won that raffle. And it was a dollar a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> he got away with a bunch of stuff. Anyway, I went to uh, airborne school in 1960. At 17 years old, I was jumping out of airplanes. I was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky for three years. I re-enlisted and went to uh, the 82nd Fort Bragg. From there, I went to Germany to the 509th. And that was the, the 509th at the time, and I think it still is the only airborne mechanized unit in the world. Mm -hmm. We're not only airborne, but we're mechanized. And from there, I volunteered for Vietnam. <clears throat> I went to Vietnam and. 67. I was there for approximately 32 months. I uh, spent uh, 18 months with the 101st Airborne Division. It was A Company, 2nd 327, the No Slack Battalion. And from there, I got wounded a couple of times. I was at the hospital at Guignan and Quezon, and then at uh, Saigon. I was there twice. And the way I got into Special Forces, the Sergeant Major, an old friend of mine that was with me in the 509th, recognized me as he was walking with the Sergeant Major of uh, Fifth Group. And he recognized me and came over and started talking to me and uh, asked me, you know, where I've been, what I've been doing, stuff like that. And they pulled up my records. And the uh, Sergeant Major asked me if I wanted to go to Special Forces. And he told me all about Special Forces and stuff like that. And uh, they talked me into it. I volunteered to go to Special Forces. I became a, a senior instructor at the Magri Rifondo School in Detroit. And I was there with them for 18 months. I had about maybe 16, 17 patrols. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, <clears throat> I went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, was the 10th Special Forces Group. And I was there for approximately three years. And from there, I got uh, I went to uh, Panama, mm -hmm. and uh, in route to Panama, they sent me to uh, Spanish language school. And uh, the only reason they sent me to Spanish language school because it wasn't on my record that I spoke Spanish. So I was there for nine months on vacation. Yeah. You know, when you first get to DLI, they give you a teak reel-to-reel uh, tape recorder and two boxes of tapes that you're supposed to listen to. And I gave back all the equipment they gave me the same way they gave it to me, unused. So I was on vacation. And uh, that's where I met, uh, oh, I go back to Vietnam. 
uh, Martha Rafe was uh, performing at the uh, at the Saigon Hospital. She was doing uh, Hello Dolly, and she came. She used uh, strictly SF. And we started talking, and she told me that she lived in L.A., and I lived in L.A. at the same time. And she says, well, when you get out, come and see me. And I did. And I became Martha Ray's traveling companion and accountant for eight years. Wow. So that was a different story. But anyway, getting back, I left uh, Fort Devens. I went to language school at DLI. And I drove, along with a buddy of mine, we drove from L.A. to Panama in a POV. And that was an experience all by itself. You know, we hit a cow, and we flipped. He had a Jeep, a Bronco. And uh, we flipped the car. And uh, the way that we flipped it, we flipped it, and the car was facing the way that we were coming from. And we didn't know. We were all dazed. We had our suitcases all over the place. And uh, a farmer came by. And people were going by us about 11 o'clock at night, just traveling fast. No one would stop. An old farmer came up with an old truck, and he <clears throat> he took us to the nearest village, which was about maybe two miles away. They took care of our uh, needs, you know, they bandaged us up, and uh, they took care of the, they brought the vehicle in, they brought all our stuff that was scattered all over the street, put it in the vehicle and brought it to us, and we tried to give them money, they wouldn't accept it. I mean, these people were really, really nice. Anyway, we got to Panama. I stayed in Panama for three and a half years. I had the scuba team. I was a team sergeant for the scuba team. And we did a lot of missions while we were in Panama, rescue missions. Uh, we were looking for people that got lost out in the jungle, stuff like that. And from there, I went to, I was a senior instructor at the University of Missouri at Columbia. I taught the, uh, the cadets. It was real good duty. I was like a, a, a wolf in the guard in the hen house. It was really <laughs> nice. I stayed at the, uh, I stayed in the uh, uh, luxury apartment on campus and everything. I had a big uh, two bedroom, all the amenities you can think of, and it was really good duty. I also graduated from the university there, and uh, <clears throat> from there. I went to the second Ranger Battalion. I was the uh, first sergeant of A Company, and then I got promoted to E9. I took over the E9, and from there, <coughs> I got orders to go to Fort MacArthur to be the senior instructor for the uh, California National Guard, uh, what do they call them? Uh, I forgot what the division is, you know, California National Guard. But anyway, I was an advisor there until I retired, and I retired in 83. Hmm. Just living the life of Riley, huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, it kind of sounds that way. However, <clears throat> kind of a couple things you kind of skipped over. is like uh, five silver stars. Three. I'm, I'm sorry, three silver stars. Five uh, purple hearts. Five purple hearts. Uh, yeah. We call that the dumbass award, <laughs> the purple heart. <laughs> Well, especially after the first two, maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was kind of wondering, um, I could go through the whole list here, but it's just uh, probably the best uh, source of getting all the exact details, because I, I couldn't go over all of this right right now, um, is when you were inducted at the, as a, uh, the Hall Ranger of Fame for the Rangers, yes. Um, they had a nice write-up in there in the Hall of Fame website for the Rangers. And it's a couple of pages long and it's like, uh, you have so many medals. You get the, you have the Arcoms with V, you get the Bronze Stars with V. Um, you probably can't even remember them all. Right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and, and to top that off, uh, right now you're waiting to hear some results uh, because somebody put you in for the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, or yeah, Medal of Honor as they call it now. That's a story all by itself. <clears throat> when I retired, I was submitted by the S3 at the Presidio of Monterey. They looked at my record and they said, has anybody talked to you about maybe nominating you for Middle Honor? I said, no. And they told me that they were going to go ahead and do it. I forgot about it. Uh, years later, a friend of mine that was involved in that uh, 
major special forces, uh, John Kleckner, asked me, whatever happened to your nomination? I said, I don't know. So he looked into it, come to find out they had lost the paperwork. It was never submitted. So he says, well, you know what? He said, I'm going to go ahead and resubmit it. So he went to his congressman up in San Francisco. They did a lot of research on it, and they came back, and they said, well, you have to go through the congressman in your district. So I said, okay, no problem. So they sent everything to Juanita McDonald, who was a congressman uh, in my district, and they had all the paperwork, they were doing everything. Come to find out she had died while in office. So all my paperwork that was up in D.C., I guess it was put in boxes or something and shipped off somewhere, but anyway, it was lost again. And uh, then years later, uh, Congressman, uh, Loretta Sanchez from Orange County, who was a close uh, friend of Special Forces, you know, she mm -hmm. got the word that I had been submitted and paperwork got lost. She says, well, let me look into it. She looked into it and they submitted it and I got an HR bill, which is a House Resolution bill that went in front of Congress. And uh, that was back in 85, I think. And never heard nothing about it. So she resubmitted it and I got another HR bill in 2017 or something, and again, didn't hear anything about it. Come to find out, Lou Carrera, who's a congressman in Orange County from the city of Orange, found out about it, and he resubmitted everything. So everything now is up in Washington. They're putting it together. So we'll find out. Uh, he told, he guaranteed me. He goes, you know, we'll get it for you. So I'll be waiting to see what happens. I, I presume that uh, this was going to be an upgrade of one of your silver stars? That I don't know. More than likely it would be. Yeah, they take one of the silver stars away and upgrade it to a... Uh, and the thing on that is that there's been a lot of people, uh, people from Hawaii, from their congressman or senator, he nominated, I think it's six or seven people that had uh, silver stars Second World War, and they upgraded them to Medal of Honor. They all got it. So and no way. And, yeah, and, that's and, who it was. Yeah. yeah. Well, good luck on that. Yeah. yeah, we'll see what happens. You know, I know what I did. People know what I did. Yeah, well, you know, could you tell us a little bit about the, I mean, it, unless one of those other medals was more personal or whatever to no, you? No, they're all, you know, uh, one of them was I was uh, with 101st. We were guarding a ammo, a uh, Vietnamese ammo dump, and we had a platoon, and I was a platoon sergeant. And about 1 o'clock in the morning, or during Tet, they attacked the location. And they came in with satchel charges, uh, RPGs, small arms, and just overwhelmed us. And they started climbing the fence and stuff. And we held them off as long as we could. I brought in uh, artillery. Uh, we had, uh, I think we lost about 50% of the people were KIAs. And I was wounded twice. And uh, we held them off until daylight, and then we were rescued by Russian Company, which was about two clock, two clicks away. Mm. What uh, rank were you at that time? I was a staff sergeant, E6. Okay. And then I understand that these came pretty quickly. These three, you you get. The yeah, my second one was uh, I was on patrol, and we were up in Phu Bai in Hue, northern Vietnam, and. Uh, we were ambushed, and uh, they uh, wounded about five or six people, and I had to go out there and bring them back, and I got shot a couple of times again, and brought them back about, so it was about maybe a click through uh, thick brush and a couple of other ambush setups and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. we made it. Okay, might as well tell us about the third one. <laughs> well, the third one, we were on patrol, and uh, we were ambushed, the platoon leader and his RTO were killed instantly. And I helped, to, I drugged the platoon leader back, but he was already, you know, he was already dead. And I had to go back and get the RTO and brought him back. And then we set up a perimeter and we did a counterattack on the enemy. We killed about seven or eight. We captured a lot of weapons and uh, that was another one. Thank you. Lots of stories like that. Yeah. I could tell by all the V's for Valor for the on, on the on those uh, awards that you got. Um, 
And then when you get out, you didn't you didn't just go away and do nothing. No, you I was doing the, a lot of stuff to help veterans. Yeah, I was the uh, lived in the city of Carson. I was the uh, councilman, or not a councilman. I was on the commission for military and veteran affairs for the city of Carson for about four years. Then I was recruited by the county of Los Angeles to uh, join the uh, military and veteran affairs for LA County. And I was there for about 12 years helping veterans. Can you tell me something about that, about the helping veterans? Uh, that position? What we did is uh, we would listen to people that had problems with stuff, they would come in. We would meet once a month and they would come in and tell us the problems they were having. One that sticks out is there was a E5 that was at Fort Bliss up in Texas, and uh, he was discharged in Texas, and he was promised a job in Pacoima, a good job. So he drove from uh, Fort Bliss, he lived on the economy, to uh, uh, Pacoima, mm -hmm. and he had a pregnant wife, mm -hmm. and she was almost due when they got here. Come to find out that the job that they had held supposedly for him fell through. So he ran out of money, he was living in his car, he had a pregnant wife, and he came up and they spoke and told us the story. And uh, we helped him out, we got him a hotel, and uh, we sent him to a rehabilitation center where they helped his family. The wife had the baby, and he got a job. Good. So, and uh, we did a lot of things for veterans. Uh, we'd go out and uh, help them uh, find veterans out in the county of Los Angeles. We would uh, give them chits for hotels and uh, got them you know, off the streets for a couple of days. Sounds pretty rewarding. Yeah, it was very rewarding. I really enjoyed it. Hmm. So um, I'm going to refer to some paperwork here. You sure. Get, uh, no because it, you, you've just done so many things. It's uh, like, was, how many years in the Army was it? 23. 23, and then all of these different things. Um, let me let me read, uh, and this is an abbreviated list. Well, you know, the reason it was 23, you know, I was thinking of staying in, but I was a single parent at the time. And uh, once you make command sergeant major, you're, you're under the thumb of the U.S. Army. They send you where they need you. And uh, <clears throat> they wouldn't, uh, all the slots for uh, E-9, command sergeant majors and special forces, were already filled, and they wanted to send me to Germany to be the command sergeant major of the 3rd Armored Division. And uh, I had a five-year-old son in Germany, and I said, no, I don't want to go to Germany, so I retired. Yeah, and what about thoughts about even going to an armored division? Oh, no way. <laughs> <you know. laughs> okay, I got, let, me, let me read some of these sure. things here. I, like I said, my memory's like a suit here. But, um, this is a partial list of... Uh, of uh, your, uh, shall we say, extraordinarily high, highly de decorated uh, person you are. From the three silver stars, you get three bronze stars with V for valor. One with V. Two. Oh, one's with the V. Okay, I wasn't sure that the way they write it, it's, right. it's not clear. Thank you for clearing that up for me. Five purple hearts, uh, two ARCOMs, one with the V or both? One with the V. One with the V. And many other awards and the badges, like from the Combat Infantry Badge, Jump Master, Halo Jump Master, uh, Scuba Diver Badge First Class, Air Assault, Jungle Expert Badge, Ranger Tab, uh, which you graduated first in your class, by the way. The one thing I can't figure out is uh, you got a bunch of good conduct awards. What, what's with that? It said you, go, uh, you had good conduct? I just never got caught. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up for me. <laughs> So, um, and, and I'll go back to this again for some things you did later, but um, the obvious question is with all of these things and all being wounded and just coming back for more and more, what, what kept you going? You know, what made you want to keep going out there and doing that, volunteering again and again? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with the people I was with. You know, I felt obligated and then we were almost cut from the same slab of meat. You know, we all thought the same and uh, we were out looking for each other. And uh, that's one of the reasons I stayed in Vietnam for so long, because I enjoyed the people I was working with. And uh, one of those things. 
one big brotherhood like yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, special yeah. forces is a false brotherhood. Yep, I know that. I extended for six months so I could have my one year when mm -hmm. I was there. So I, I know the feeling. Um, so let me go back to my list here again. This, this is, a, again, from the uh, 2008 uh, Ranger Hall of Fame. When you were, uh, when you were out, you were vice president for Brownstone Security in Redondo Beach. Uh, you mentioned the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Commission. Um, you were selected as Veteran of the Year in 2007 in the state of California. Um, like I said, you were the president of this association and got your induction there. Uh, there's all that. Uh, I guess that's that's all I got from that. I'm sorry, but no problem. Anything else you think I should put in there? Well, we you know, uh, presently I'm working for a, a nonprofit organization. It's called AVAG. American Veterans Assistant Group, and what we do is we help veterans, uh, not only Army, but uh, Navy, Marines, and the whole bit. And things that we do is we have lunches for them, uh, we have games, we have an outstanding chaplain, Doreen Matsumoto, who goes out and does all this stuff, organizes everything, and she's doing a fantastic job. And we do things like we give away uh, mechanical wheelchairs, wheelchairs, uh, things that they need. We assist them in their homes, like they need maybe a ramp put into their home, we do that. And uh, we do repairs on their on their homes. And, uh, it's really a good organization. I was watching a video of you. I think you were at the, um, uh, the, the, the Medal of Honor oh, Society uh, or something like that. Yeah, and they had you up there because of your status yeah. there. And uh, you said something about that you wanted young people to know. Do you oh, recall what that was? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm really prejudiced about this. I think that everyone should go in the military. I don't care who your father is, how much money you have, what kind of education you have, but I think that everyone should at least do, you can do six months in the National Guard. And, but I think that basic training is one of the most important training you'll ever have as a civilian. It'll teach you things that you'll never know about yourself out in civilian life. It'll teach you things like uh, organizing yourself, how to work with other people, uh, uh, time management, which is a very important thing. Mm -hmm. I had a security company and I had over 300 employees that for these people not to show up didn't mean nothing to them. But I had to pay the heat because I get a, a telephone call at 9 o'clock in the morning with a client that's very irate, saying, where's my guard at? He's supposed to be here at 6 o'clock. And I have to jump through hoops to come to find out that the guy just didn't show. And uh, the mentality of young kids nowadays doesn't mean that much. But anyway, I think the military, just basic training itself, is very important for these kids. All right. Is there anything else you want to put out here for people yeah, to I'm, know? I'm uh, fat and happy, and I'm just glad to be here. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you.